Dear beloved, we want to thank God for yet another wonderful opportunity to sit at the feet of the Lord. He's all shed us into the last quarter of the year 2023, and we are eternally grateful. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you this morning, this day. Wherever we find ourselves, we want to give you praise and glory for making it possible to hear you speak to us again in the language we understand. We pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit will take over completely. Chat with us, Lord. Put us on, on your shoulders. Put us on your lap. In any position that will be comfortable. Yes, we want to be comfortable. <laughs> To hear your word, accept it, practice it, and see results. We pray, dear Holy Spirit, for grace to be obedient to whatever you tell us. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Dearly beloved, we are so grateful to the Lord for was showing us into the last quarter of the year 2023. The Lord has been good to us, isn't it? We want to give him all the glory. Today we are on a 12th session of effective witnessing. And uh, we continue to talk about the witness to one. In the story about the, uh, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, as we saw last week, it was reaching out to one to reach a city. If you think Saika is a village, fine. But for the whole, the Bible says the whole city came. The whole village came. The whole town came. However you want to take it, you know, put it. But it was through one person. Having time for one. Leading to an entire town, an entire city. Here in the gospel. In our discussion today, we're going to be looking at again witnessing to one, and this time with the Ethiopian eunuch. So we are saying, you know, in the Samaritan woman, it was witnessing to people of other faith who may be like us, but it's a little difference. Okay, it was a Samaritan. They had a temple, and yet they and the Jews couldn't see eye to eye. You know. They all had a twist, as to the Samaritans had a twist to the message. So people like that, now call them people of other faith, people um, who may not be of our church or whatever. Here we are looking at people of our faith, people who are sitting right in the church, who have heard everything about God. Everything about Christ, everything about the Holy Spirit. And yet, like the Ethiopian eunuch asked that question, of whom is the prophet talking about? Is it about himself or is it about somebody else? Isn't that interesting? That somebody can be in the church and has not yet encountered the Christ of the church. That reminds me of, uh, I was speaking in the church and uh during the Bible study time, you know, we will break for Bible study. One of the elders of the church, you know, the question was put as to how one is saved. And this man, gloriously looking, noble looking man, elder of the church, said it's by keeping the Ten Commandments. You can see that this man has been in the church from childhood. Since his infancy, he has been baptized as a baby. Grown up around that time, he must have been in late 60s, 70s. And as an elder of the church, he believed that to be born again, you must keep the Ten Commandments. <laughs> um, it's true, but it's not correct. How do you tell such an elder before all the young people in that group, you know, Bible study class, 
who had better knowledge that he is not correct. But there are many like that who are still seeking the Christ of the church. They are hearing all the sermons every day, but they have not yet had an encounter with Christ. So when we say witnessing must start from Jerusalem, we are talking about starting right in the church. And it's only when you have time for the individuals, that is when you will see the lack, the ignorance of people who are sitting right in the church. So as we look at this, um, perhaps that's the reason why the Lord wants us to just keep talking about the individual. Witnessing to individuals, the importance, because you see, they serve as bridges to people you will never be able to encounter. And if you do it well and they come to that point where they can say, what keeps me from being baptized? I want to be a disciple of Christ. I want to identify as a disciple of Christ. And you will come to the point with individuals in the church. We are having a club. Many will keep coming. They will die and be buried as believers. We will say all kinds of things during their funerals. But they will go to hell. Because they have not yet encountered the Christ of the church. Shall we just take this study and please let's um, be critical. And let's begin to see um, how we can take this message more seriously. And get to work right in our midst. So we're looking at the the seeker, um, the Philippian, Ethiopian, uh, what do you call it, eunuch and Philip, from Acts chapter eight, twenty six to forty. Take your highlighters, take your pens, take your Bibles, take the uh, the version you love most, and underline the scriptures as the Lord reveals them to you. And let's go. But after we have had a discussion, let's obey the Lord. Let's move and tell somebody that it is Jesus who died, who was buried, who rose again, through whom alone we can access salvation, eternal life. Amen. So please, let's read. Acts 8, 26 to 40. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that runs from Jerusalem down to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a man of great authority, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariots. He was reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Then the Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard the man reading the prophet Azar and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I understand unless someone guides me correctly? I like the way the Amplified Bible has put it correctly because there are many interpretations now. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now this was a passage of scripture which he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, 
his judgment was taken away, that his justice was denied him. Who would describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch replied to Philip, Please tell me about whom the prophet says this. About himself or about someone else? Then Philip spoke, beginning with this scripture, he preached Jesus to him, explaining that he is the, prophet, the promised Messiah and the source of salvation. I'm reading from the Amplified Version, please. As they continued along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch exclaimed, Look, water! What forbids me? For being baptized. Philip said to him, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I do believe that Jesus is this the Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he replied, and he ordered verse 38, and he ordered that the chariot be stopped. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip and carried him away to a different place. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the good news of salvation to all the cities until he came to Caesarea Maritima. Amen. Maritima, Maritima. Amen. So this is the scripture. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch. Let me just share some interesting thoughts, you know, something I came across about the fulfillment of prophecy. And it is alluded that 25 of the prophecies about Christ were fulfilled between the time when he was arrested to the time when he was crucified, within 24 hours. Within 24 hours, 25 of the promises of the prophecies got fulfilled. And we see the one spoken by Isaiah in Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. As the lamb before the sharer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Justice was denied him. Who would describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. When you look at Psalm 25, you can find about five or six of those prophecies being fulfilled. From the verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I think verse 18, where his garment is, is uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, the, the, a lot is cast over it. So the last verse, you know, where he says it is finished, you know, and in between, you'll find about two or three more. 25 prophecies that have been spoken. As I was speaking about 700 years before Christ was born. You know, going to the, the, the prophecy, I mean, uh, from Isaiah right down to Malachi, it is frightening to see how every one of God's word has been fulfilled. You're talking about you know, one of the prophecies, lead, you know, talking about Nineveh being overrun by water. And it, apparently it was a saying that except the water becomes an enemy to Nineveh, there's no way. It could be taken. And that's exactly what happened. It said with an overwhelming flood, he will sweep over anyway. 
And that's exactly what happened. They had been besieged by enemies for years. They couldn't do anything. And so they were, they were flat. They broke through the wall. And that's how come. Because the wall was its defense. It said the waters become an enemy unto the enemy. It could not be fulfilled. Tyre will be totally and you know, annihilated, totally destroyed, and it comes to pass, even in recent past. You know, the precision with which God keeps his word is made me so humbled and so afraid of God. Whatever he has said, he will bring it to pass. Though it tarries, wait for it. It will not time. It will definitely come to pass. And especially as we look at the other side of prophecies, especially those pointing to his second coming and his soon, uh, what do you call it, the judgment that is coming to reward every man according to his works. You cannot give an excuse. You cannot hide behind anybody's work according to your works. It is very frightening. It is very frightening. And when we see ourselves trying to worship God in our own strength and failing and failing and failing, it calls for us to sit up and allow the Holy Spirit to do what only He can do through us. Because time is of essence. We cannot continue this try and error in our own strength. Amen. We'll get tired. We'll give up. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to do what He alone can do. Our helper, comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, sustainer, Intercessor, standby, teacher, reminder, rebuker, guide. Let's allow him to do it. So let's get back and look at a few points, you know, regarding this conversation. <laughs> So here we are looking at a proselyte, you know, and when we say um, a proselyte, we are looking at somebody outside the, or precisely a Gentile becoming, um, or subscribing to the faith of Judaism, all right, to the faith in Judaism, I mean to Judaism. So... Um, I believe, you know, um, this is why, how did Judaism get to Ethiopia, the south? Remember the queen of the south, she, uh, queen of Sheba, coming to visit Solomon? I believe that's when the faith was transferred over there, the power of one. The queen of Sheba was simply awed, looking at the beauty and listening to the wisdom of Solomon. He said that not even half was told me. He carried away the faith. And I believe that is how this noble Ethiopian um, eunuch somehow got to know the faith. That will make him travel all the way to Jerusalem every now and then to partake of the worship. Hallelujah. Hmm. I mean, I was looking at the Asbury Bible commentary and one of the things was saying that it takes divine intervention to extend the witness of Christian experience to a proselyte. You know, and because this man was coming from Jerusalem, at that time, Jerusalem was filled with the message of salvation because the Jew, uh, I mean, um, the disciples were in there. You know, when you look at Acts 5.42, for example, it said every single day in the temple area and in homes, 
they did not stop teaching and telling the good news of Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. So the message was going on in the temple area where this Ethiopian Jew had just visited. When he says he takes a divine intervention, we are talking about the fact that people will hear but will not hear until they are given that exclusive time alone. He heard it because when he says, what prevents me from getting baptized? I don't think Philip was talking about baptism. But he had heard, but be, be repent and be baptized. That was the message. Repent and be baptized. He had heard it in Jerusalem. So when he saw the water, if he saw that I have heard it, that is what it takes for one to be called a disciple of Christ. I believe. Let me be baptized. What we are saying is that he had heard the message broadly. But he needed somebody to point out to him who is this that the prophet is talking about. Is it about himself or is it about someone else? He needed somebody to introduce to him Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. I want us to take a very important, crucial you know, not, I mean, as it were, of that very important truth. Assuming that everybody in the congregation is a Christian. There's nothing as far from the truth as that. Even as we see the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, Epitomize. A Jew a Jew, a Jew, subscribing to the tenets of the faith and yet knowing, not knowing the God of the faith. What is word has said, pointing to the fact that salvation will come through his son. The truth about the faith, or if you like, the real faith. Hallelujah. There is some other issue that I would like us to also look at what made it possible for this encounter to take place. And here we will highlight Philip. And one important characteristic that we want to point out in Philip's ministry and is that of obedience. You see, we can pretend to be doing ministry and not doing it the right way, the right time, the right place. <laughs> ah. You know, recently, the Lord seems to be accusing the church of not praying, prayerlessness. And I was asking him, we are praying. I had a long conversation about it. We are praying. So what is prayer? When it is not a conversation with me, where I can equally talk, where I can show you what to pray about, when I can direct, when I'm at the center, what is prayer? When it's just instructing me about what to do. When it's not according to my will. We are talking about obedience. There's certain characteristics that we need to imbibe if we're going to be able to do it right. And here, one of the key um, keys, let me put it, Key keys <laughs> that I want us to take note in Philip's ministry. Effectiveness is obedience. First and foremost, he has an angel. I mean, telling him, perhaps in a dream like um, Joseph had, or physically, 
what is impossible? You know, just went into the prison to get um, Peter to get up, get dressed, and get out. You know, initiated a jailbreak and got him out. So he could be physical. I mean, the angel of the Lord encamps around the dwelling of the just and he delivers them. Oh, the Lord doesn't open your eye. Oh, please, let him open your eye. He's deployed the angels to be our ministers. We are not to worship them. No, they are supposed to minister to us. All right. In a very special way. Um, and it's amazing how they do it. In so many beautiful ways. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Philip's obedience had the angel you know, telling him he had had a very fruitful ministry in Samaria. And definitely, after such a powerful ministry, everybody would want to invite you home to give you gifts, give you honor. You need a personal counseling and all that to make you the man of God is in town. Then the angel says, get up and go to the desert. What should I go and do in the desert? What is there in the desert? Where no one will be there to heal me. Where there will be no platform to stand on. Loud speakers to use. Lies you know, blazing around me. What is in the desert? You know what? If we are going to do this work well and hear the Lord say, well done, we must be very careful how we go about it. How do I lead the limelight, the pedestal, to get into the wilderness? Not even giving details. Let's read it. Let's read it. But an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that runs from Jerusalem down to Gaza. No details. Just get up and go. And he goes. A desert road. So he got up and went. <laughs> What happened with? There are times when the Lord sends us into the desert, right? There is no appeal. The desert of life. The desert has a stage. There is no appeal. There is no honor. The sun is blazing. There are, there are even no trees to stand under for shelter. Dusty feet. Go down to Gaza. Go down into the desert. The road that runs from Jerusalem down to Gaza. Is the Lord sending you into oblivion? <laughs> oh, Lord. Or perhaps he has sent you there in the form of sickness. You're lying in the bed there, groaning. In the form of adversity, the Lord has sent you into the desert. Bereavement. Financial difficulties. Has the Lord sent you into the desert? Philip went. And we must go. Because there is a peculiar encounter that you cannot get in the city. You cannot get among the crowd. There's that peculiar encounter with the Lord that you cannot get anywhere else. I remember attending a conference somewhere. And this is a, 
on a, a system Bodeka land, very big land. So normally I will just go. I mean, I knew the Lord wanted us. I mean, I enjoyed it. This long walk, pray. Alone. And I, I was wondering why I was not even afraid because the way it were woods, I mean, all kinds of things could pop up. But somehow, all the time that I went, I never saw anything frightening. <laughs> Though sometimes the area looked a bit school. <laughs> no dark, no, I mean, a bit frightening. Right? Let me put it that way. Then one of the days as I went, I just heard the Lord telling me, look on the ground. And as I looked, I came across two Coke cans. Two Coke cans. A vehicle had passed over the two of them. One had been flattened. Flattened out completely. The other one had been flattened halfway. So the back, you know, the under was still you know, Belgian. But the mouth, you know, the towards the edge you know, had been flattened. Then the Lord said, take a look at these cards. So I bent down to look at them. Then I realized that the one that had been you know, totally flat, you know, flattened, had ants all around it. But the other one, which had one side flattened, they don't have any ants. So what does this mean? He said, the one that had been properly flattened is juicy. <laughs> because every bit of the coke in it has spilled out for the ants to enjoy. But the one which has its edge flattened is sealed. And what is daring cannot go forth. Immediately I knew what the Lord was talking about. And it was like saying, make a choice. Make a choice. Do you want to be a vessel of honor? There's a need for crash. <laughs> Until everything, self, ego, pride, foolishness is out. I didn't understand what that question would mean. But today I do. Has it finished? No. Are there tears flowing? Plenty. Am I being a vessel of honor? I don't know. Because I'm still struggling with my foolishness. Pride, ego. And cry, Lord, have mercy on me. But the question is on. And Lord, even as I share with my brothers and sisters, it's a way of just letting you know. Don't stop. It is hard. It is lonely. It is frightening. I don't stop. Don't stop. Until you are completely done. Increase. And let me decrease, Lord, until there is none of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go to the desert place. 
There's no fanfare. There are no big lights. There are no billboards displaying your name. Go to the desert place to meet one. Hmm. Yes, Lord. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a man of great authority, a court official of Candace. Candace is just a title, just like Pharaoh of the queens of Ethiopia or the queens of the south, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning sitting in his chariot and reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. We are talking about obedience. Obedience. Let me just read what Asbury um, Bible commentary said. Philip's obedience to God indicates where God was able to use him so powerfully Instead of raising questions about the sense of going out on a desert road, he went. Instead of discussing the wisdom of a strange, lone person approaching an undoubtedly well-protected caravan, he ran up to it. If we wonder why there seems an absence of direction by God in our day, perhaps we need to look at the quality of our obedience. We want to go where we'll be applauded. Philip went where he didn't know what was awaiting. So sometimes I, I ask myself, are we listening to God? Or we are listening to men? Who are we serving in this ministry? Whose voice are we hearing? Are we really hearing the voice of the Lord? Because it comes to a point where everybody is saying the same thing. But the fact that everybody is saying the same thing does not mean that is a mind of Christ. This is not how we do ministry. We do it like this. You buy the instruments. Then you do it like this. Then you do it like that. And we even derive instances where we will have the opportunity to meet a few. Convert a few. We want the big crowds because that is what shows that God is there. God was not in the thunder. He was not in the earthquake. He was in the still small voice. Instructing Elijah what to do next. Until our leaders, especially the leadership in the church get back to sitting at the feet of Christ to tell us <laughs> his mind will continue to fail in our ministries we'll finish preaching the big messages yes because God is true to his word and it will not return to him without accomplishing the purpose of which he has sent it somehow Somebody will benefit. But the true import and the power of word that should be accompanied, accompanying the word for effective transformation will not take place. Because we just saw that preacher preach it and we thought it would be good for our congregation. We are not giving the people the meat that the Lord has prepared from his table. Are we listening? Is God with us? Is God speaking to us? Is God speaking through us? Obedience is key if we are going to prosper 
in the assignment that has been entrusted to, our, to us. And war betides us if we don't do it the way the master wants. Hmm. Now, Philip had gone into the wilderness, into a common road through the desert, not knowing what was ahead. But Jesus has said it, go you into the highways and the hedges and invite the wedding to the wedding feast as many. When the Jews, I mean, I mean, was sharing this parable, and of course the Jews knew he was about it was about them. They refused to hear. Go into the byways and the highways and compare all to coming. Now, after <laughs> Philip had gone into the desert and the caravan had passed by, that is when the Holy Spirit now comes here. Go near and join yourself to this chariot. So we first and foremost an angel and then the Holy Spirit whispering into the ear. I mean, we could be settling on this for the next one year. The whisperings of the Holy Spirit in our ears. Being interested in everything that we are doing. Go here, go there, say this. Don't say this. Are we listening? Are we listening? If he was not listening, he would the child would have passed by. And the encounter would have been lost. Our minds are filled with too many stuff. It is time to declutter so we can hear the Holy Spirit's whisperings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, um, he was able to explain the message. I mean, we look at the, the concise preaching. Of um, Philip. The Enoch asked a question. Is this the one? And he simply emphasizing, you know, emphasizes who Christ is. Let's let's just go back to it again. And perhaps ask ourselves, are we preaching in a way that will make the people see who Christ is? From verse 35, then Philip spoke and beginning with this scripture, he preached Jesus to him, explaining that he is a promised Messiah and the source of salvation. That was all the message. He preached Jesus. The motivational preaching uh, is good. But if it's not pointing men to Jesus, then we are failing. What are people being motivated to do when they don't have a relationship with Christ? Church, let's get back to preaching Jesus. Because men are yearning to know Jesus. We want to see Jesus. It's a cry of the children, the cry of the toddlers, the cry 
of the of the what um youth teenagers the cry of young adults the cry of adults the cry of those in the sunsets of their lives you want to see jesus they need to prepare people who are you know somebody said i'm with i'm, I'm the departure departure lunch lounge to meet jesus who are waiting to meet Jesus and yet are so frightened because they are not sure whether they have met Jesus. We go to give them communion at home because they can't come to church. But the question is, are we making sure that we have preached Jesus to them? To give them hope of eternity. Hallelujah. Are we doing it well? That was all the message. But as they continued and they came along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch exclaimed, Look, water, what forbids me from being baptized? Like we have already hinted. He had must have heard that message in Jerusalem. Repent and be baptized. So Philip said to him, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And like Romans 10, 9 and 10, let's read it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Let me just read it for you so that we will see what the demands are. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes in Christ as Savior, resulting in his justification that is being made righteous, being freed from of the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. Let's add verse 4, 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, Whoever adheres to trust him and relies on him will not be disappointed in his expectation. And that's exactly what the Ethiopian, you know, you know, and that is where we need to be sure we are bringing people to in what we call evangelism or discipleship. After you have evangelized a person, introduced a person to Christ, you want to disciple the person until he comes to that point where he can really be able to identify with Christ, be able to say, I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I do believe. Yeah, Philip said, you believe with all your heart. And he replied, I do believe. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because that is where the problem is. Is Jesus the Son of God? Is he the way, the truth, and the life? No one coming to the Father except through him. Is it in him alone that the record of eternal life has been placed? He who has a son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Have we emphasized that enough for our recipients to understand that it is Jesus. It is Jesus and him crucified. This is the message which we are supposed to take to one. From children to teenagers, and I would say toddlers to children, 
to teenagers, to uh, youth, young adults, adults, old adults, people just about stepping into eternity, making sure that they identify with the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. They stopped and he was baptized. And the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. When people have truly encountered Christ, the glory that radiates, the joy that radiates from their spirit. And from this one Ethiopian eunuch, we know how in, you know, Ethiopia has played such a significant role in the Christian witness. One to a nation. One as a gateway to a nation. You never know. You never know. You never know what is going to happen to those children walking around you. Teacher in the classroom, you have all that opportunity. Nurse in the hospital, you have all that opportunity. Some have done it at a great cost. Go ahead and do it. Eternity is real. Eternity is real. Hallelujah. He went his way rejoicing. Amen. I put something down on confession of faith. Let me just read it for you, even as we draw the curtain on this conversation. The confession of faith which the Enoch made in order to be his being baptized was very short, but comprehensive and much of the purpose and was sufficient. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was before a worship of the true God, so that all he had to do now was to receive Christ Jesus, the Lord. People are in the church. They are worshippers of the true God, but they need to receive Christ. Worshipping the true God must be done aright. It is through Christ. He said in times of old, God went at our ignorance. But today, for now, now, he is saying that salvation is only through Jesus. Salvation is only through Jesus. And we can't do it any other way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Acts 17, 30, uh, 30. Therefore God overlooked and disregarded the former ages of ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. To, that is to change their way, old way of thinking, to regret their persons and to seek God's purpose for their lives. Hallelujah. Because he has set a day when you will judge the inhabited world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and destined for that task. And he has provided credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. We are reading from Acts 17, 30 and 31. They are worshipping the true God. But God has ordained that by a man whom he has appointed and destined okay, to procure our righteousness and has proved, given what credible proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. It is only through him that we can assess eternal life. 
that we can live the life of righteousness and be pleasing to God. There is no other way. And this is the message, the simple message that we have to share. Share. This is a simple message that we should bring our disciples to, as it were. Bringing them to that point where they can agree with us, believe with their hearts that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Dearly beloved, maybe you are listening today. And you, you are still confused about which way is right. There's only one way. If, Jesus, if God gave us so many ways to choose from, then all will be included in hell. No one will go to hell. He says he has set a day, the days of ignorance. God is winking at them. But now, he has set a day when he would judge the inhabited world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and destined for that task. Is that man? Is Jesus. And he has provided credible proof by raising him from the dead. Christ died. Christ was buried. Joseph of Arimathea, you know, Nicodemus, they were all at the graveside. They put him in the tomb that Joseph had kept for himself. Nicodemus brought some spices, anointed it, wrapped his body in, sweat, you know, in the burial clothes, and put him in the tomb and covered it with a big stone. The Jews asked that the, even the grave be secured because he had said that he will resurrect. So the disciples do not come to steal the body so that the story at the end becomes worse than the beginning. Soldiers were guarding a dead man. For me, it shows how important Christ was that even when he died, he had the bodyguards. Isn't that amazing? On the third <laughs> you know, was it the angel of the Lord that came to roll the stone? Did the stone roll by itself? Did the earthquake roll the stone? It makes no difference. Because you know, when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God by whom everything that was made was made, got up, I believe the stone gave way. By whatever means. Folded garments. Wow. Walked out of the grave. Triumphant. Mary Magdalene saw her. He says, don't touch me. Because I am yet to show myself to your father and my father. My God and your God. I'm going to present the blood. <laughs> the blood. That spoke once and for all. I'm going to present it in the Holy of Holies. Because now the curtain is torn. Because as soon as Jesus said it is finished, the curtain got red from top to bottom for everyone to see what is in there. Signifying that now we have access into the holy place. Because the Son of God will present his blood once and for all to speak on our behalf. So we no longer have to carry booths and cows and goats into the temple to atone for ourselves. What can the blood of a goat do for us? It is Jesus. It is Jesus. Oh, the blood of oh, Jesus which has never lost his power. The blood that is still speaking on our behalf. It is just Jesus that we are presenting to you. 
And it is only once you are alive that this blood can speak for you. As soon as you die, it is appointed unto man once you die, and after that, there is judgment. It is too late. You are not going to purgatory because there is none. There is no midway between heaven and hell. And you can make that important decision, that awesome choice today. Jesus is Lord. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But all have seen Romans 3.23 and come short of the glory of God. So 1 Corinthians 15.3 and 4, Christ died for us. He without sin. You will know in no sin. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He died. He was buried and he rose again. John 1 12. So, as many as receive him, as many as believe on his name, he gives us the power to become children of God. Yes, we have eternal life. God has given us this testimony which is in his son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You want this life, don't you? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You want to pray this prayer out. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart that Jesus is Lord. Yes, Lord, I confess with my lips you raised him from the dead and is alive for me. But I've sinned. I'm a sinner by practice. I'm a sinner by nature. I'm a sinner by choice. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. I acknowledge Jesus as the Lord over my life. Come into my heart, Jesus. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. And hold my hands and help me walk in this faith walk until I see you face to face. Thank you, Lord, for hearing me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dearly beloved, we draw the curtain here. But the message is clear. The message is clear. God wants us to reach out to those in the church. There are seekers in the church. They are looking for Jesus. They want to see Jesus. And we are the link to them. If there's anyone that has been called into the wilderness of life, May the Lord strengthen you. He has a peculiar encounter with you, for you, through you, that cannot be had in any other place. Be still and know that He is God. May God bless us. May God keep us. May God strengthen us and bring us together again. In Jesus' name.